Okay. Uh, so before I joined Dialog, I was working on a hobby project to write an APL interpreter on or for the Plan 9 operating system. And this talk is just going to be about one of maybe two features uh, that I've added to that interpreter that we don't have in Dialog, which I think are quite nice. So just a quick introduction. So Plan 9 is an operating system that it's a research operating system that came out from Bell Labs and is, I think development started somewhere in the 80s and the first release maybe in the start of the 90s and it sort of died out at some point. Uh, then the, some people made a fork of the project called Nine Front where they continuously add uh, small enhancements such as drivers so it continues to be sort of usable. And the name for the operating system comes from a movie, Plane Down from Outer Space. Sort of the same, the same reason for the title of the presentation, APL 9 from Outer Space. So why on earth would I write an APL for Plane 9? Well, uh, I need a programming language, and there was no APL, so that's pretty much the reason. So a bit of the history and current status. It all started in January this year, uh, the first line of code. At least that what, that's what my Git repository says. And then I spent around three months adding basic primitives, and a lot of those are implemented as, implemented as models, so implemented in terms of other primitives. So the, the performance is not good, but I don't really care about that for this project. Then I had a, a pause when nothing happened, and then I was asked to do a small presentation uh, internally at Dialog, so I did some stuff. And then I had a pause again, and now I was asked to do this presentation, so I did some more stuff. <laughs> yeah. So what's currently missing? Well, you can see over here there's, it does say there's an error, it just doesn't say where the error is or exactly what it is. So for those of you who didn't, uh, didn't spot it, the second quad IO is actually quad I zero. It's hard to spot that. So all the fancy stuff is pretty much missing. So we don't have any debugging or much of the useful system functions or good error messages. And speed is still missing, performance is missing. Documentation is very much non-existent. <laughs> uh, and users, but that's a good thing because then I don't have to write the documentation. So just to give an overview of the presentation, I'm going to focus on two unique features or one, uh, depending on how you view it, and that's something called message passing. Uh, it has to do with multiple threads communicating with each other. Uh, yeah, and I'll go through what it is in general and some example use cases and try to make a demo script so I can just click and don't have to type all the lines of code. Uh, yeah. So first of all, concurrent programming. Sometimes it's nice to run stuff in separate threads. Uh, not always just for performance reasons, but for example, if you do an operation that is blocking, such as reading or anything, uh, it can be nice to do that in a separate thread, but then you have the problem of how to communicate back to the original thread. So in Dialog, we have the spawn operator, the little ampersand, uh, which spawns, as I understand it, lightweight or green threads. So the interpreter decides when to switch between those. And in APL9, we also have sort of the same operator, but here the threads are operating system processes. So the operating system decides when to switch between those. So yeah, the problem is how do we share information between those threads in a sane way? So we could use global variables, but that would require some sort of locking because we don't have control in the interpreter of when another thread is going to do stuff. And I don't like that option. We could return a result, but then the parent would have to specify that it will have to wait for a thread to finish and what if we want to wait for a thread, one of, out of many? So perhaps we spawn maybe five 
threads to do something and we're just interested in the first of them and the result from the first of them. But there's an option that's sending and receiving messages. So that when we look at other program languages, I think there are two general models for how to do this. The first one is using channels, something like they do in the Go program language. So you create a channel and uh, every thread can put stuff in, in, um, in one end, and other, every thread can take stuff out again in another end. Uh, of course, taking stuff out when nothing is in there is a blocking operation, so we can use it to synchronize and so on. But it, it sort of requires a way to receive from one of many channels, uh, for example, if we spawn many threads again and want just one result. Uh, and as a fun fact, the C I use to implement it on Plan 9 has channels in the standard library. Uh, and I might use that because it could be easy. Well, that was a, the first thought I had. Uh, and just as a side note, I mentioned it like in Go because that's where I, I learned about them the first time. But some of the main Go developers were actually Plan 9 developers. So yeah. So there's another model. I don't know the real name of it, but I call it the mailbox model. It's sort of like they do in the Erlang program language. So each thread now has a mailbox, which is a location for messages to go in. So everyone who knows the thread ID of another thread can send stuff, but only the thread itself can sort of pick stuff out. So it's the same as real mailboxes in, in the physical life. So if someone knows your address, they can send you stuff but you're, only the person, you're the only person that's supposed to take stuff out again. Uh, but it requires then a way to select what to pick out of the mailbox, because we have no control of, we have only one location for stuff to get in, whereas with channels we will have different locations. So what I did in APL9 was to use the mailbox model. And I decided the thread IDs for now are just scalar numbers, I think this is the same as dialogue. And messages, they are any APL array. So we can send any array. And I've added three basic primitives. So the spawning is sort of the same in, as in dialogue, except I made it a dyadic operator, so I can give it a name. It's purely for debugging, but yeah. And then sending is this uh, box with a right arrow inside, so it says message sends to then an array of uh, thread IDs, and it will send it to any, every one of those. And then receiving is a monadic operator. So it takes an operate, operand function, which is used to select uh, which message in the mailbox is going to be picked. So it's going through them one by one in the order of the, the same order as they appeared in the mailbox, and then it will filter in. And we can give it a timeout if we don't want to wait for a while. And I have two system functions. Oh, one of them is a system variable, I don't know what it's called, to get thread ID, that's a self, and threads is to get information about the threads currently running. So I'm going to give a few demonstrations. Uh, the first one is just going to be sort of using those so we can see them in action. And then I'm going to do one where I define a thread that will just double up with whatever is sent to it and send the response back so if I send a 10, I will send 20 back to the same thread. And then I will do a last demonstration where we have a chain of threads, each sending something to each other. Uh, yeah, so that requires me to switch to the virtual machine. Didn't work. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So I made this demo script. Hopefully it works today. <laughs> so I can just click instead of typing. So yeah, as I said, the send primitive is just a dyadic function. So I can say the message is hello there, and we can send it to ourselves. And our own thread ID is, is assigned by the operating system. So in this case, it's 632. And I send the message to ourselves, and the output we get here is not that we received it, it's just a message. So that's just how the send function is defined. And then we can look at the state of the system. 
So threads with the right argument of zero will give us the thread ID, because of course we already knew that. Uh, we can get the thread name. We can get the number of messages currently in our mailbox, so that's one. We can get, yeah, some debug stuff, so how much stack is used and so on. And we can do it all for once for all currently running thread, threads. So I see the main thread is started by the system and so is the session thread. Yeah. So we have one message and let's receive it. So yeah, here's the simplest filtering function you can have. It's a function that always returns one. So it'll always accept the message. Uh, if it returns zero, it will reject it and go on to the next. It will not remove it from the mailbox. It will just not pick it out in this invocation of the operator. So we got it, and we can see it's a two element vector. So the data we actually sent and the sender, which in this case is ourself. And we can do it again. And we get a timeout error because we asked to wait for zero seconds and there was no messages in our mailbox. Uh, yeah, we can try to wait for five seconds and it will fail soon, yeah. And as a last thing, if we don't want it to time out, we can give it the empty vector. And that's interpreted as don't time out, just wait forever. But since we have no way to send it anything now, it's, I'll just go on to the next demo. Yeah, so first we define this double up function I talked about. It receives a message and assigns who it came from and the message to two different names. Then we send twice the message back to who and redo recursion. So it runs forever actually once we start it. So we spawn it and give its ID in the variable ID, we can check it. Ah. So the ID in this case is this. Uh, we can check its status, so it's running, but it has no mails in its mailbox. We can check our own status, of course. We can send a few messages to ourselves, that's just to demonstrate how the filtering stuff is going to work. And uh, we can send something to the double off thread, which should respond to us. And we can send, again, a message to ourselves. So now we have four messages waiting for us. The three we sent and the one the double up thread sent to us. Um, and we want to pick out the one from the double up thread, so not just the first one in the mailbox. And we do that by making a filtering function that only returns one when the sender is equal to the ID variable we have. And we can do that with this nice little fork. So ID equals the first element. We might as well get all the other messages. So we can define a function that will uh, get one message and then append it to the list of messages already have. And if we get a, an error 12, that's a timeout error. We stop. So we'll just get any, everything in the mailbox if we run it. Yeah. Hmm. So just the last demonstration. Yeah, this is the chain demonstration where we define many threads running and sending stuff to each other, just to demonstrate that. Uh, so we define a function that receives a message and sends the message plus one to the task that has ID omega. So it receives a message, sends plus one to omega, and that's it. So it, it terminates after it has done its job. So now we start a thousand of those. And we use the power operator because that's exactly the pattern we want. So the first one gets self as the omega, and the next one gets the ID of the first respond and so on. So now we have 1,002 threads, where the two are the ones started by the system. We can start the chain by sending something to the last one and waiting for the result. And we define a function for that. So send something to the last, wait for a result and pick the, only the data so we don't care where it came from. 
Yeah, and it runs, and then we go. And then all the threads have ended because they only had one job, and they completed that. Uh, so let's go back to the PowerPoint. So these are the demonstration I prepared, and it's all I think is very fun, but is it really useful? Well, I have two use cases I could imagine. Uh, so one of them is since the threads are handled or switched between by the operating system, it's kind of hard to do, say, an output to the session without them just overlapping, unless we do some locking inside the interpreter and so on. But we could start a thread, the session thread, which would just accept messages from anywhere uh, specified with some tag or something specifying what kind of message it is. So is it an error message or normal output and so on. And then it will put stuff out on the, on the screen as the only place where stuff it has, is outputted to the screen. So everything becomes synchronized pretty easily. That's what the session thread is. So yeah. As another example, we could imagine different interpreters communicating over a socket or a pipe or something like that, but where the actual communication was hidden behind messages. So we would set up this remote stuff and then just send a message to an ID, a thread ID, and it will appear on the other end because it has been serialized and put over the socket or whatever and deserialized on the other end and send us a message to whoever set up the remote connection on that end. We can this way create a network of APLs. It's something I have not explored fully, but I think it could be fun to look into. We already have a, a small demonstration of that. It's, uh, yeah, and who says the other end has to be an APL? So in general, this idea of using messages to communicate with other systems uh, is worth exploring, I think. So the way it's implemented right now is that we have a system and another system and I used a pipe on the file system, so we could use a socket or whatever. And then on each system, we have the user threads, that's the uh, threads we get into, the, the one the interpreter calls main. And we set up two threads to the remote stuff. The R thread is the one we send stuff to. So the user sends a message to R. It will then serialize it, put it over the network or whatever, and then there's an input thread that will just continuously be reading from the network. That's a blocking operation, so we need to do that in our thread. And it gets an array, deserializes it, sends it to R, and then R realizes, okay, I got a message, but it's not from the user, so I'll send it to the user. And of course, it works the other way around as well. Uh, so to the user, it appears as if the only communication happening is with R, but actually it's going over the system. And if we have time, I can just switch to the virtual machine again. It's funny, it, it doesn't like switching screens. Uh, the trick is to turn off presentation mode in. Okay. Let's try. Yeah. So here I have two interpreters running. And I have a, a function that's loaded in when the system starts, and it's called remote. I don't know if it will fit on the screen. Probably not. Maybe if we're lucky, the fund is pretty big. Yeah, OK, it fits on the screen. So what it does is just it opens a pipe, and it starts this remote thread and so on. The details are not really important. But what we can do is we can say ID and then uh, assign remote and we need to give it a name because it's a, it's an, the connection is made via something on the file system. I'll just call it APL. So now that site is set up and we can do the same in the other window. And now these systems should be connected. So we can, in the one window here, we can just start waiting for a a message uh, for however long we need. And then over here, we can send it. 
something. And it will appear on the other end as if it was from the same system. Yeah. Uh, okay. It worked. <laughs> so to summarize, APL9 is a APL interpreter that runs on Plan 9, but the features could really be implemented anywhere. It's just that I needed one for Plan 9. Uh, and my view on concurrent programming is that it doesn't have to be this kind of nasty thing where you have to consider locks and everything, and it doesn't have to be difficult to do. I think messages is a very natural way to uh, do communication. And at least it doesn't have to be about performance. So we can do stuff just because it's easier to organize that way. Uh, <laughs> if you want to get started, you only need a Play 9 system. Uh, you can get one here. You can get the source code for APL 9 here. And if I write documentation, it will be here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, use it at your own risk. I might change stuff suddenly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Any questions? Right. Go to the mic. Uh, so, what's the the total amount of time you spent developing this APL interpreter from scratch? I mean, it started in January. Yeah, but how many hours have you put into it? <laughs> no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't good, kept track. Good of answer. It. Um, you gave a flippant explanation for why you decided to write APL, which is good, per se. But I have a question. Why did you choose APL? Were you aware of it for some reason? Uh, yeah, I was getting aware of it, and I just like writing interpreters. So I have, did, I have done those uh, prologue interpreters before, and I decided I needed a new project. So APL was a good way to both uh, write an interpreter and get to know the language a bit more. So. So, I'm sorry, I'm, the acoustics are not great or my ears aren't. Right. <laughs> but Anne, you, you were aware of APL? Yeah, I was aware of it, but I wasn't using it for anything. Okay. So it was more of a project for me to learn a bit more of the language and to write an interpreter. And where, uh, okay. can I ask another question? Yeah. Where do you get the glyphs with a quad and an arrow in them. Oh, I just I just opened the Unicode page and looked at the API <laughs> section. And so it exists. Okay, yeah. I see. And finally, why did you write one reverse oh, yeah, symbol one. instead of just Sorry. reversing? Uh, no, it was not reverse. It was a constant. So if you give it an array and then the <coughs> what's it called? Yeah, it's, it creates it a function that always returns the operand. So it's a constant function, always returning one. It's not uh, flipping. It's not? No, Just not in that case. High problem, OK. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Thank you. OK, stunning. Thank you very much.